Welcome to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Hey everyone, it's Jenny Lisk, and this is episode 108 of the Widowed Parent Podcast. So I had such a great discussion with Katerina Salisbury for this episode, and we are continuing with Children's Grief Awareness Month, and this is the second episode in a two-part series with the Salisbury family. Katerina is with us this week, and last week we spoke with her mom, Leela. I hope you had a chance to catch that discussion. I've heard from so many listeners that it really was insightful and worthwhile, a uh, very powerful discussion. So I'd like to thank Leela for sharing with us. Uh, Katerina, who's with us this week, her daughter is just 15 years old. And she lost her dad when she was five. She is very articulate and she's passionate about helping grieving kids and teens. And it really was great to hear her reflex- reflections and perspectives and to be able to bring those to you today. And I always think it's such a privilege to be able to hear directly from a teen or another young person. Um, so I hope that it will help those of us who are widowed parents to try to better understand our kids' perspectives. I hope you enjoy my discussion today with Katerina Salisbury. Support for this podcast comes from BetterHelp. You can talk with a licensed professional therapist online, anytime, anywhere. Visit betterhelp.com slash widowed parent to learn more and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash widowed parent. I hope you'll check it out. My guest today is Katerina Salisbury. Katerina is 15 years old and she's joining us today from Lexington, Kentucky. Katerina, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, well, thanks for coming. You know, I've been really looking forward to this. Um, I talked to your mom earlier today uh, for listeners, it would be last week's episode, um, but lucky me, I get to talk to the Salisbury family twice today. Um, and this is really terrific because I don't think I've ever done a two-part episode like this, talking to two members of the same family who both lost the same person and yet but have very different lived experiences because you lost a different person in your life, right? You lost a different role. You lost a dad. Your mom lost a spouse, um, and it's a very different experience. Yeah, sometimes when my mom and I will be, like, talking about that loss, we both, like, express it, like, in very different ways, and we're like, wait, you were kind of thinking more that way? I was thinking of it this way, so. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, she was saying earlier today, she said, oh, this is going to be great because you'll probably hear, you know, some of the same events and some of the same facts, but a totally different take on it or a different, you know, memory of what happened or, you know, um, and just, it, yeah, it impacts people differently, so, um. So cool. So I, I'll put a link in the show notes for listeners to last week's episode, part one. Um, and you can hear from Leela, Katerina's mom, all about her experience. And now let's jump right in with Katerina. Um, so let's just start out. Can you remind us, um, your, I mean, your mom told us a little bit about your family, but tell us, you know, before your dad died, tell us a little bit about your family, how old you were, where you guys were living, what was kind of before life like? Um, so it was me and my mom and my dad, and at the, I was five years old at the time, and we were living in Jackson, Mississippi. And it was kind of just like our little family unit because the rest of our family lived up, well, up here where we are in Lexington, Kentucky. And it wasn't till like um, seven years later when we moved back to be with them. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. So five years old. So that was about 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, like we said, you're 15 now, you're in high school, um, and you, your mom, and your dad. So what happened? Um, when I was five, my father committed suicide and just kind of left my mom and I like very much like alone because a lot of our fam, well, most of our close family was a long way away and we didn't have very many like close friends in Mississippi. So we were kind of just, it was kind of like the two of us, you know, trying to face whatever came next. Mm, Yeah. And you were five. I wonder, 
I don't remember anything from when I was five, but of course that was a lot longer ago for me than it was for you. Do you remember much about that time or what do you remember about that time? Um, I honestly don't remember like a lot about what happened like in the earlier, but I remember like his death, like the week when we like got the news that he died and then kind of like the funerals and services afterwards. And then a little bit of like what going back to school was like, but after that, I just kind of blocked it out. Yeah. And so were you in kindergarten, first grade, something like that? Um, I think first or second grade. Mm. Um, and you went to the funeral? Yeah, we had one funeral in Jackson. And then a couple of weeks later, we drove up and um, we put him to rest in the Lexington Cemetery. Okay. Okay. And did you know right away that um, that he died by suicide? Uh, no, um, that was actually something my mom and I fought about for a long time. Um, like right when he died, she told me that he had been in a car accident. Mm. And so I thought he was in a car accident. And that's what like I processed my grief, you know, as though he died in a car accident. And then when I was about eight or nine, she told me that um, he had actually committed suicide and that caused like a rift between us for quite a while because I was like very angry that she hadn't told me. And like looking back now, I understand why she didn't tell me because I was five and I wouldn't have understood it or been able to like grasp the concept and it would have just made me more confused and hurt. But so I'm wondering, can you tell me a little more? So you said, so she, well, how did she, did she just sit down and say, Hey, I have some news. I mean, how, that seems like a terribly difficult and awkward and horrible discussion to have. Oh yeah. She's told me like multiple times after she was like, I had no idea how to have that conversation because yeah. there is no like great way to have the, you oh, know, yeah. your person committed suicide conversation. Right. So, um, I do remember that we were um, we were driving in the co- um, in the car coming home from Girl Scouts, and mm. then she was just like, "I have something to talk to you about," and then she just kind of told me. Mm. She was like, "I figured the car was as good a place as any to tell you." <laughs> like, fair enough. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, like you said, there's no good place. It's not like if she told you right. in the kitchen, you'd be like, "Oh, well, that was just so much better." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so we're. Uh, were you shocked or, or angry or how, like, how was that? It was very overwhelming. I mean, I was shocked because like, I had even, I haven't, ah, I hadn't even considered the possibility that that's what could have happened. Mm. I was angry that she hadn't told me. And then like, it opened up like a whole new side to grief because then I was angry that like he left us, like he left me, he left our family, like he chose to leave. And that just like made me like more angry, but then like confused because I still loved him. He was still my dad, but it just brought like a whole new like level of complication into my grief. Yeah. Yeah. I can totally see that. Right. I mean, and you had one set of, understanding or set of what you thought were the facts that you like you said processed your grief on that basis um and then everything kind of just shifted without warning yeah Mm. um your mom mentioned that i guess it was in the first few years sometime when you were younger when you were still in mississippi anyway you guys had gone to the uh shoot i forget the name of the center but a kids and family grief center that was in your community there can you tell us about that Uh, Yes, the McLean Fletcher Center. That was, it was one of like the best experiences of my life. And that Mm. might sound weird, but it's whenever I went there, it was just like, it was a very like warm place. And like, when I went there, I could just be a kid. Like I didn't have like responsibilities, you know, like I wasn't, I wasn't sad. It was just, it was a happy place. And you were with other people who had been through similar things or who understood what you were going through and weren't going to like accidentally, like say something that made your grief worse because Mm -hmm. they didn't know how to deal with it because we were all going through similar things. And so that was just, um, it was a great experience. And I actually went twice. We went from when I was like six to nine. So like three years 
And then when I found out that he committed suicide, we had stopped for a while because we'd kind of gotten through the worst of it. But then we started going again. Ah, so you were a little bit older then. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they say is that kids, as they get older and as their brain develops, you know, cognitively over the years, um, they start to have new levels of understanding of situations. Plus, you had this new understanding of the new facts that you were eventually told. That must have been tricky. Or, like, how was that going back the second time? Um, I feel like going back the second time was a little harder because, um, partially because I felt like his death was my fault in a way. Because like I'd done, yeah, like I'd done something wrong or like I hadn't been enough for him and that's why he left and that's why he like committed suicide. Uh, And so going back, I was kind of like ashamed of that at first, mm -hmm. you know, because I felt like I was the reason, like I'd driven him away somehow. And so it was kind of tougher to talk about that in groups at first, Mm -hmm. but there were other kids who's like, people had committed suicide. And so eventually like I did grow comfortable enough to like talk about it. And that really helped me process a lot of it at the beginning. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. You know, it's interesting. I think it's, it's um, well, your mom mentioned also feeling a lot of, I think she said guilt and shame around it because she knew from the beginning that he had died by suicide, even though you didn't know that. Um, she talked about how she, when she went to the first adult group, uh, she told them that it was a car accident. And then she said several people that went, like they went around the circle taking turns. Right. And the next several people mentioned that their person had died by suicide. And then she realized that she should go ahead and tell, you know, be honest with them at least. Yeah, I feel like a lot of that happened at the Fletcher Center because um, I know in my group there was a kid and he'd been coming for like, we'd been in group for like three months and he still hadn't said like the circumstance of like how his person died. But by that point, there were a couple of us who had people die by suicide. And so then um, finally, I remember one session, he just, um, he was able to like say like my person died by suicide. And I think that's just because like we'd all like gone through, we'd like told our stories and like we weren't, we weren't like embarrassed by that fact. And I think that's kind of what mom went through in her own group. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's terrific that you had that. Oops, sorry. I'm dropping my pen here. Uh, Had (laughs) that um, place to come together with other kids who had a parent who had died, who could share together you know experience this together not be the only you know quote unquote weird kid who has a dead dad or whatever other kids might did you find the kids at school how did they react to your situation um it kind of went one of two ways it was either they like were like okay that happened and then just completely forgot about it and moved on with their lives Mm. or they kind of like labeled me as the kid with the dead dad and just kind of like like put some distance between us almost as if like it was contagious <laughs> but <laughs> and these are little kids I guess these are like grade yeah. school age kids or like how long like is or is that problem still going on um it was a lot I think it was it was mainly back in grade school but then um also in middle school that happened a lot mm. um by that point we'd moved back to lexington and so i was in a new school and not a lot of people knew about that um you know my situation but some people did and then they would be like kind of weirded out by it mm. or like get like very uncomfortable if like i brought it up for any mm. reason well that's actually that's an interesting point you not only changed schools like because you left the elementary school and went to the middle school but you changed entirely from one city the city where you were living when everything happened and the kids who were your classmates when it happened of course they were going to know but you went to a whole nother state a whole nother community with new kids right so I think a lot of kids wonder teenagers wonder you know do I tell my new friends or how do I tell my new friends? Or is it weird if I tell them or is it weird if I don't tell them? Or like, I wonder if you have any thoughts or suggestions on navigating that. 
Um, it's definitely a tricky thing. I think I told a couple of my close friends after I'd known them for a while. And like, I knew that they weren't going to like, like they weren't going to like purposely say anything to hurt my feelings. It's Mm. definitely a hard situation, like finding the balance between like, what do I share and what don't I share? Because I think it is important to have people you can talk about it with. And even, and we didn't have a support group here. And so that was even harder for me because like, I wanted people to talk about it with, but I didn't know, you know, anyone else who was going through this, had gone through this or like had lost someone. Mm -hmm. And so um, I told a couple of my close friends and in their own way, they tried to help me, but they're always there as like a listening ear, even Mm. if they can't really like relate to what I'm saying. Mm. And I think finding people like that is good. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, those are good friends to have. Those are great friends, right? People who are going to listen and be supportive and, and try to be supportive, even if they don't quite get what you're going through because they haven't been through it. You know? Right. Yeah. Cool. Um, I was just thinking back to the idea of being the weird kid whose dad died, or, you know, the kid with the dead dad, I think you called it. Yeah. And I was reading, um, I think you you gave a speech recently to a group of mental health providers. Maybe we can talk more about that in a few minutes. But um, uh, I was reading your remarks, which is terrific. I really admire you. Fifteen years old, and and you know, to, it's a really an important topic, right? And there's and there's more people now, more teenagers with dead parents because of COVID, right? As well as all the people with dead parents for all the other reasons that was happening pre-COVID and will continue to happen. Um, anyway, my point was that you said in here, um, let's see, I was still the girl with the dead dad. Um, let's see, our teachers would single me out in class to say things like, Katerina's father died recently, so everyone pray for her and her family. wonder how that landed with you. Um, this was more in elementary school, like yeah. um, like right after it happened it must have been and a private school a private school if they're talking about prayer no it's mississippi public school oh okay all right <laughs> yeah okay but um it was honestly it was like i was like very like embarrassed and just upset because i mean no kid wants to be singled out for like that reason mm. and just then i felt like teachers were like pitying me or just kind of, I mean, some people who knew like what really like the circumstance of my dad's death, like those teachers were judging me for it. Mm. And so it's just, and no kid likes to be singled out in class anyway, but especially for reasons like that. And then that lets like the other kids know like what happened. And yeah. if it's not something that's gotten out to everyone yet, it's just, it was pretty horrible. Yeah, it sounds like it. And you were little then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was like six. So I was like, is this normal? I mean, <laughs> I don't know what's supposed to happen after, but yeah, yeah, I could see how that would get awkward really quickly. Your mom mentioned something when we talked earlier about at some point, I don't remember, I don't, I'm not sure at which point this was grade school or middle school, but about bullying or some bullying that you experienced. Can you tell us about what, what the deal was with that? Um, yeah, that was in middle school. Um, I also lost, um, my grandmother right before I went into seventh grade. And so I was like very upset and like in the middle of processing all that. And then that also like brought up, you know, some stuff from my dad's death previously. And so I told a friend about it and then they kind of, they told another friend and then it got around the school that, you know, my dad had died and um so everyone kind of knew and people would just like give me like weird looks in the hallway or this the one thing that like the one time that really stood out to me as like very much blatant bullying was um this kid and I were kind of like in an argument and I said something and then he said well at least I still have a dad that loves me and I was like wait 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 some idiot said that to you in class Mm-hmm. Yep. The like end of class. And I kind of, wow. I looked over to the teacher cause I was like, are you going to do anything about this? Cause yeah. that is not okay. Yeah. 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 
And the teacher just kind of like looked up and then just like very pointedly looked away. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's the adult that should be like stepping in and saying, this is not okay. Yeah. Wow. Did you ever have a chance to, or like go back to that teacher and say like, Hey, like that wasn't cool. I mean, I guess it's kind of hard to do as a kid. Um, I don't know. It, did it ever come up again with the teacher or was that just kind of, that was it? Um, it didn't come up again with the teacher. Cause like the other, like other kids were on my side. They were like, dude, that's not okay. And so yeah. the kid never said anything like that again, but oh, that's um, good. I never really cleared it up with the teacher. That's terrible. I mean, not you. I mean, with the teacher, <laughs> the teacher's reaction. I mean, I'm, yeah, that's really unfortunate. You know, one of the things um, there are some, one of the things I've learned is that teachers actually generally don't receive any training, you know, in their, in their teacher training. They learn lots of things about the subjects of teaching as well as about classroom management and grading and all these things you need to know to, to be a teacher, which is many, many things. And apparently grief and the topic of having grieving students in the classroom and, you know, how they might address that or handle that or, you know, work with that apparently isn't generally part of teacher training. Um, no. And I think especially in like Kentucky or in Kentucky and like states that don't have like grief centers or like support groups and programs, like teachers do not get like any like formal training for grieving kids, but also like kids who have been through trauma. And so they just kind of don't know how to handle it when these kids like come into their classrooms and are struggling and need support because they've never been like told like what they need to give them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope that you might be able to speak to here. I'm giving you things to do. You don't have to listen to me, but <laughs> you know, I think it's terrific that you gave this talk to the mental health people. And I think another terrific audience would be teachers and administrators. Yeah, that's that's mom and I's goal. We were like, okay, we got the mental health specialist. <laughs> we're moving on to the teachers now. Yeah, yeah. And you could do so much of it on Zoom these days, you know? I mean, yeah, that would be terrific. Because I think hearing directly from, you know, a teenager who has been a teenager and a child going through this is really important. You know, I mean, I think it's also important to learn about the, you know, the... Uh, I don't know what you would call it, clinical information from professionals. Like that's one aspect, but hearing your lived experience, I think is really valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, cause I feel like I've processed my grief at multiple different stages now. Mm. So I kind of got like the full range. <laughs> well, yeah. I say that, but you know, yeah, up to, yeah, up to, up to this point. Yeah. That's, you know, it's, um, there's a book that you might find interesting. It's called the after grief by Hope Edelman. Um, and she, her first book was called Motherless Daughters and specifically about early mother loss. Um, but her newest book, The After Grief, is about the like the impact of grief throughout the entire lifetime. Um, I, have you read the book or heard of it? Um, not The After Effects of Grief, but um, Motherless Daughters I did read. Yeah. Um, well, then you might be fascinated. So one of the things she does in The After Grief is she goes back and she found a whole bunch of the people she initially interviewed 20 years ago for Motherless Daughters. And she interviews them 20 years later about their experiences and how their perspectives have stayed the same and how they've changed and how things, you know, how the longer term, um, you know, span of this has gone for them. So I thought it was really, really interesting. No, yeah, I'm excited to read that. Mom and I have like this list of like, you know, like grief books and people involved in grief. Yeah. Oh, there's actually a funny story. So um, because mom's like starting her own center, like we're all very involved in the grief world now. Yeah. And so the other, like a couple of months ago, she was on a Zoom and I kind of walked past and I was like, is that David Kessler? <laughs> and like, I just recognized him on site. And yeah. So. That's awesome. And tell us, so tell it for listeners who maybe haven't heard of David Kessler, tell us who he is. Oh, um, I mean, I don't know, like, yeah, right. all the specifics, but. Right. He, he wrote a, a new book recently called, um, shoot, what's it called? He's a big guy in the grief world. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking, writing, thought leader, he gets quoted right. a lot in articles and, and things. Yeah. Yeah. I forget what his newest book is called, but yeah. Um, cool. Okay. So, so, so what, where to go next? Well, um, you mentioned your grandmother. 
So um, you moved from Mississippi back to Kentucky and you were how old? Um, I like 10, 11. Okay. And so, and your grandmother lived in Kentucky. So um, was she, I'm guessing she became a pretty big part of your life after your dad died and even more so after you moved back to, to live near her. Yeah, definitely. She um, actually came to stay with us in Mississippi for a couple months right after um, my dad died to kind of help mom through that. And then we would see her like every summer and Christmas break. Mm -hmm. And then when we moved back, she was she was kind of like another parent figure to me mm -hmm. because like when mom wasn't there, like she was like the other like pillar in my life. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's terrific. And then but after you've been living in back in Kentucky for a couple of years, then she died. Yeah. And it was a very sudden death too. like, no one was expecting it. Um, she went in for like a standard procedure and then she just didn't make it. Wow. That's, that's terrible. Um, she must not have been terribly old. No, she was very young and we'd just gotten back from like this whole trip out West. And wow. so, yeah. So I wonder then, so now your grandmother died and you were 12 ish, maybe. Yeah. Um, so seven years after your dad died, your mom said that, that when her mom died, she thought, Oh, we've been through grief. We know, we know this grief thing that this will be, you know, I mean, we'll be sad, but we can handle it. Um, is that what happened? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> as it turned out, we did not know that kind of grief. And I think that's like kind of a misconception too about grief. Like once you go through it one time, like you're good, you know, you mm -hmm. know how to handle it. But um, especially cause it was just like such a different type of grief. And we were like, just so unprepared for it. Mm -hmm. So I think that it was actually a lot harder the second time, like that second grief process, I feel like. Mm. Why do you think that was? Well, I think for me, it was because like, she became that other like fixture in my life after my dad died. And so now that she was gone, I just had mom, but you know, she was grieving her mother, which is just a terrible thing. Mm. And so it was just, I felt like very like, kind of unstable, like, not unstable, but just like everything had changed so suddenly. And I just wasn't sure how to process or go through any of it, especially because there weren't any like support groups or like the Fletcher center here. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And did you find because it was your grandmother who died that people maybe didn't quite understand how much it affected you or kind of dismissed its effect on you? Um, yeah, I found that happened like a lot, actually, like I tell someone, you know, my grandmother passed away and they'd be like, Oh yeah. Like my grand parent passed away like a couple of years ago it's sad and then just and I was like no like I'm really affected by this and it's, it's just um I feel like a lot of people kind of dismiss grandparent death because mm. you know it's not like your parent you know people think like you don't live with them like you're not as close but um that's not true for a lot of people and it can be like just as hard as losing a parent in some cases very yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and I think it's it's a good reminder that you know making assumptions isn't necessarily a good <laughs> a good idea. I mean, I, yeah. I can see how it will be easy for somebody to make an assumption. Okay, her grandmother died. That's sad, but in the scheme of things, you know, kind of dismiss its importance. But I can see how if they understood that your grandmother really had this really important role in your life and that you now had two major losses at a young age, right? Starting with your dad and then adding your grandmother. Like there's, I don't know if that's like a compound effect or something or like, you know, I mean, this wasn't your first loss. This was adding to already grief and loss. Right. And this was also like around the same time when I started to go back and like reprocess my dad's loss because I feel like that was like kind of like the third time I processed it, like I, right after he died. And then again, when I learned he died by suicide and then kind of like going into like my teenage years, 
Right, because right. you get those brain upgrades. It. Your brain was right. like massively growing and developing. But sorry, I cut you off. Um, no, you're good. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I was like reprocessing that and then just this loss on top of it. Yeah. And I was in a very bad place for like a year and a half. I was just, and it like affected me in like all aspects of my life, which a lot of people like don't assume it would, you know, like, oh, you're sad, but you know, you can continue functioning like you've been, but I was like very anxious and my anxiety just got worse and worse and just school wasn't as meaningful for me anymore. Mm. And I was struggling a lot there because I just didn't care because mm. I was like, you know, like these important people in my life are gone. Like anything could change at any minute. Like, do I really need to know the Pythagorean theorem? <laughs> like, uh-huh. yeah. And so it was really hard for a long time. And I think a lot of people just didn't get why it was affecting me, like in school and like, you know, like other places. And this was a change for you, right? You previously had had done well in school and, and, and school. Oh, yeah. I like, I, I, I love learning and like, I liked going to school and like getting good grades and like reading and all that. So it was like a very drastic change for me to like not care. And I feel like that was something that um, my teachers could have done like a little more to support me in because hmm. um I just did not feel like very like supported by like them. They were just like, okay, well, your grandmother died a couple months ago. You should be over it by now. Right. Uh, yeah. I was like, that's not how it works, but yeah. they, I needed like some more like one-on-one help to like try and get caught back up in the later months. And they were like, well, you know, you haven't really done stuff up until this point. Like, why should I help you now? And I'm oh. like, well, because I was struggling a lot and I wasn't in a place to be able to do it. But. Right. Huh. So how, how did you turn that around? I mean, you sound like you're probably back to, well, is school still a struggle or have you rounded some kind of corner where school now is something you are uh, interested and engaged in? Um, I think I did like, I round, I kind of rounded a corner. Um, like mom really encouraged me and like um like we went to like a special like specialized therapist and like she got me like a lot of help and um she was always like she was there for me a lot during that time and kind of like just kept like with like the structure of how we'd been doing things before to try and get me back on the right track Mm. and I think um I do still struggle like with school sometimes and like my anxiety but um, it's getting better and I have like a lot more like coping mechanisms now. And like, yeah. I know how to deal with it because like, you know, I've seen it happen before and like, I know some like kind of ways to get through it better. Yeah. Yeah. Terrific. Well, I mean, you sound very motivated and passionate, especially about this topic of learning about grief and learning how to help other people and learning how to, um, you know, talk to this group of mental health people and, and share your message and, and all those things. Um, is this uh, give you any thoughts about future career uh, ideas? Oh, definitely. Um, I decided that I want to become a psychiatrist. Ah. And I decided that a couple of years ago because I think like we got, I'd gotten through like kind of the worst part of that journey. And I was like, um, I want to be able to help people like the way you know like I was helped during this time and Mm. as someone who's like been through this I kind of get more where they're coming from and I just want to also be an advocate for people who you know don't have like the experience or like the resources to like you know get up in front of people and talk about their grief because I think it is much more powerful when it comes from like grieving like teens and kids But like a lot of people, like a lot of them are not in a place where they can openly like talk about their grief and, you know, share it with people. Right, right. Yeah, you could be in a in a in a really influential position of advocacy for for, you know, on behalf of teens like yourself. And right now there's more too many more of them. Right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Huh. Terrific. Well, so so. um, 
your mom has started this grief center, the Kentucky Center for Grieving Children and Families. Are you, is this her thing or are you involved in some way? Um, so uh, I am involved. She's um, currently going to start doing like groups in school with some younger kids, like elementary, middle schools. But then um, in a couple months, we're going to be starting up teen groups. And um, I was actually involved in a program um, that the University of Chicago Med School did this summer. It's a peer-to-peer grief support curriculum. And so they train teens, they train teens to be like teen group leaders and then like they train adult support. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty much like the teens are like running the group and going through like like the information and like sharing and stuff and the adults are kind of there for backup Mm. which Mm -hmm. I feel like it's not the way it is in a lot of teen groups and I feel like that can be more helpful for teens to Mm -hmm. see like people who have gone through or are going through like the same things at the same time Mm -hmm. and so um yeah we're going to be starting those groups soon and so I like to think it's a group effort to get this center started yeah no that's terrific that's terrific uh and i mean what great experience too for an eventual career in psychiatry and working with are you thinking about psychiatry specifically working with teenagers or youth yeah adolescent psychiatry yeah yeah well hey that's a much needed field right i mean ask any parent who's trying to find a psychiatrist who can see their kid right now (laughs) we need more of them Definitely. And that's kind of like what mom was like struggling with when she was like trying to find like a psychiatrist for me. She was like, no one is equipped to deal with like, you know, grieving like trauma kids, you know, Mm -hmm. because like a lot of like the research doesn't say how it'll affect kids. And just there's a lot we don't know about that area. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like we need more people in it. Yeah. Yeah. That's terrific. Cool. Good. Well, I'll, 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 uh, I'll look forward to watching your your progress in your career on that front over the next, I guess it'll be a, a bunch of years to get through high school, oh, yeah. college, <laughs> medical school, but uh, you'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I was thinking about some of this stuff and your mom and I had a terrific discussion today and it's so useful, I think, to hear, you know, her perspective and your perspective and everyone's experiences and reflections. And one of the things Early on, I didn't realize, but I heard this. Someone pointed this out early on. You know, my kids and I lost the same person. You and your mom lost the same person. But we lost a very different relationship to that person. And that um, means that trying to understand, I think for those of us who are listening who are widowed parents, trying to understand as much as we can what our kids' experiences might be, right? By hearing from other people, Um, like you who are currently teenagers and also I interview people who are now adults but they lost their parent when they were young Um, and hearing you know with their perspective you know 10 20 30 40 years out um, is really helpful too I think so one of the things that your mom mentioned um, I made a few notes from our our discussion about celebrating your dad's birthdays and death anniversaries and like how you guys would can you tell us how you guys would acknowledge those over the years or how that has been um yeah so I think with my dad like we would mainly kind of like remember him like we call it like the death anniversary like the Mm. anniversary of his death um so we would always get like his favorite like takeout food and then like we'd bake something together and then I think one of like the most like meaningful things that we did was we would write letters to him Ah. every year and then we would burn them and like we said it's so like the ashes would like float up and get to him ah, uh-huh and uh that's a terrific idea did you guys um read each other your letters before you did it or they were completely your own um they were mostly our own but sometimes it's like I had something that you know I wanted mom to know that I was sharing mm. we would do that yeah and then she mentioned that there was one year, I think you guys were on vacation or something and you missed his birthday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we usually like tried to do a little something for his birthday. But one year we were on vacation and then um, we got back and I was kind of like, hey, when is that? Isn't it like coming up? And she was like, yeah, that was three days ago. And I mean, uh-huh. I was I was kind of upset because, you know, like. I thought like so we'd mention it at least. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So it was hard because we didn't do like a whole lot on his birthday, but you know, I was still upset that we hadn't like that. I got like, I kind of like missed that chance. I feel like, yeah. You know, I think um, I'm glad this has come up because I think people wonder, parents wonder, right? Like, should I bring it up? You know, should I mention, you know, especially if the kids are younger, maybe they're not looking at the calendar, you know, they're not realizing that today is, you know, whatever day it is. And that's the birthday or death anniversary of the important person. Um, and parents might wonder if they should just kind of let it go by without mention or notice. Or, you know, if mentioning something is too, you know, somehow make it harder. Um so, so it's interesting. Thank you for sharing your, you know, your perspective as, as the kid on that, that was hard to have, see it go by without notice. Yeah. And I feel like it depends on like the situation, you know, and like how open you are with each other, mm. but I think not mentioning it or like the kid finding out later can do more harm than just telling it to them because yeah, it'll bring up some stuff and like, that might be hard, but you can like deal with it like together as opposed to like, you know, the kid being mad that their parent didn't tell them and then having right. to like deal with it like separately. Right. Right. Yeah. I know that makes a lot of sense. And especially it makes sense, you know, when you describe it, I think it's the kind of thing that, that, you know, me included wonder, right. Like not knowing what I'm supposed to do. Right. <laughs> then you wonder, yeah. should I mention it? Should I not mention it? You know, um, so, yeah. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, let's see what else. Well, I'm wondering what, if you don't like this question, let me know, but I'm wondering if there's something, you know, you wish your mom had known or done differently or something that, I don't know, if you'd go back in time and wave a magic wand, um, what would you hope would have happened differently? Um. I think I just wish that I would have been more open with her about what I was going through because mm -hmm. I feel like we were like, we are very close and like, we do tell each other a lot, but um, I did like, like I didn't tell her that I was like being bullied for being bereaved mm -hmm. because I was like, well, the teacher didn't do anything, you know, like why would you know mom do anything about it right and looking back I was just like that is not a great idea like of <laughs> course she would do something and uh -huh. I just wish like I told her it but I told her more stuff like that when it was happening yeah because um I think even in like the talk I gave to like the mental health specialist she was like I did not know about a lot of that like that you were going through and then you'd gone through in the past and I was like yeah <laughs> And I feel like it would have been a lot easier for me if I would like confided in her more and told her more what I was going through and just listened to what she was going through. Mm. Because I feel like kids in grief, like think a lot about like their own situation and like I lost, you know, my dad, but I also forgot that, you know, my mom lost her husband mm -hmm. and I just like, didn't think of it in that way. Mm. And like, I, I knew she was grieving, but I didn't, know like the ex to the, like the extent she was grieving and just like what she was really going through because we just didn't talk about it all that much right 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 well one of the um i got the sense from my discussion with her earlier that that you guys have learned how to talk about difficult things and not shy away from you know talking about grief and death and suicide and those are all hard topics and nobody wants to talk about them and i think it's terrific that you guys you know, have gotten to the point where you can talk about these things. Yeah. Well, I think it's like, they're all like very like taboo subjects in mm. society. And now that we've kind of like been through that and like that we're more open about our feelings and we can talk about it to each other, we're kind of like, well, we should be able to talk about these, you know, to like other people without them being like weirded out or be like, yeah, that makes me uncomfortable. Like yeah. it makes you uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I'm living it yeah 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 and so yeah what are you most looking forward to about the the grief center opening up um oh there's so many things um I think the main one is just getting to like help other kids the way that um and giving them the support that we had when we went to like the center back in Jackson mm. 
just because that was just it was like an amazing atmosphere and just I think especially it's so important for kids and teens to just go and just like have a nor like you know like more normal childhood like do like silly dumb things there yeah because I feel like that's like a lot of like grieving kids like miss that in their life you know because like they're kind of like forced to like grow up quicker or, like they have to take on more responsibilities right and right you know because like there's not there's someone gone from their family and it's just a lot more but mm-hmm. so I feel like at these centers you can just kind of like relax and you're not worried about that you're just having fun with your friends yeah oh that's terrific and I'm glad you guys are going to have a center there in your community I, I know that um I'm not sure what the numbers are in Kentucky but I know nationwide that you may have heard of the children's childhood bereavement estimation model the CBEM from Judy's house in Denver does a study every year, looks at all the numbers. And that's um one in one in fourteen kids will in nationwide uh will have a loss of a parent or sibling before they turn eighteen. And I think the numbers in Kentucky are slightly more than that. Slight slightly more kids will have that experience. Yeah, I think in eastern Kentucky it's either one in ten or one in eight kids. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of kids you know it, yeah and yeah. that was something that I kind of like thought about going through like my grief I was like well theoretically if there are 20 kids in a class there's at least one other kid who's going <laughs> through this right but just isn't you know doesn't know that other people are going through it or like there's no like outlet to go to where mm-hmm. you know that other people will be going through the same experiences and you can like band together there right. just wasn't that right right yeah. Gosh, well, I think we've covered so much good ground here. Is there some aspect of your experience that we haven't covered that, that you wanted to, uh, to talk about? Um, I mean, it's like, just like one thing, like, you know, um, I've been thinking about it a lot is, um, uh, like getting like professional, like clinical help, because I think it can be like beneficial to like a lot of kids and teens going like starting at a young age and learning like you know like therapy is like not taboo and it's not something like to be scared of Mm. because um I have some friends like going through tough things right now and they were just like oh I can't do that because like it means there's something wrong with me Mm. I'm like it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you it just you know means that you're getting some help right to get through a tough time and I think just something like I want like other kids and like teens to know is that it might be like kind of hard and like a little awkward at first, but um, you know, it can really help if you're willing to like put the effort in and do the work. Like, and I mean, I'm so glad that I did like, you know, go to therapy and like get the help I needed because I'm just in a much better place now Mm. and I'm still working through stuff, but it's a lot easier because I kind of have like the foundation that I can build on. Right. Right. Yeah. Terrific. Well, I, th- I think that I hear that your generation Gen Z is much more open to, you know, seeking mental health support or talking about it or, you know, less stigma than in, in prior generations. So I think that's um, hopeful that maybe, you know, things will yeah. go in the right direction on that. Yeah. Terrific. Gosh, well, I think we could keep talking about this all day. And it's such a treat to talk to you and your mom in the same day about both of your journeys and your reflections on this experience. And uh, and again, it's been 10 years since your dad died. Yeah. It's coming, up some, on a- coming up on 10. Yeah. Well, if you could talk to him today, what would you uh, what would you want to tell him? Um, just that. Um, I know like I've really like struggled with my feelings like of, you know, complicated grief and the feelings for him in the past because like I was upset and everything, but that I still do love him. And um, just that I hope he'd like be proud of the person that I've become because Mm -hmm. although like the experience was really hard, we got to meet some amazing people and, you know, start like a grief center, which is, probably not what would have happened (laughs) yeah we hadn't gone through all this yeah and so um just that I'm taking this experience and turning it into an opportunity to like 
kind of give back and help others. Yeah. Yeah. That, I think that's wonderful. And I want to commend you for doing that because I think it's hard and I think it's important. Um, so Thank I'm you. glad you're doing that. And I, you know, I, I think you're, you're very well-spoken and passionate about this. I think that'll take you a long way. And I think, you know, your dad would have to be proud of, of all that. I think that's really terrific. Um, so, all right, well, let me ask my wrap up question. I like to ask, um, if you could say one thing to kids or teens whose parent has died, what would you say to them? Um, I know it is cliche, but it will get easier over time. And that doesn't mean like you're going to like get over the loss, but it means that like you'll learn to live with it and you'll find people who can support you in like your grief journey and who will be there for you to like get you through these tough times and that it does end at some point and it might not be like where you think and you'll probably have to do some reprocessing as you go through the years, but it does get better. And I think just being open with like your, like, you know, remaining parent and like the people around you about what you're going through is just so helpful because then, you know, they understand what you need more and they can just give you more support. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Well, I think that is a great place to end. So my guest today is Katerina Salisbury who lost her dad when she was just five years old. So Katerina, can you tell us um, where can listeners find the Kentucky Center for Grieving Children and Families if they're in your area and would like to um, look you guys up and find out about some of your programs? Uh, yeah, you can find us at kcgcf.org and we're kcgcf on Instagram. Okay, terrific. Well, Katerina, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Katerina Salisbury as much as I did. You can find show notes and all the links at widowedparentpodcast.com. Look for episode 108. And if you missed my discussion last week with Katerina's mom, Leela Salisbury, please do go back and check out episode 107. It was a terrific discussion, and I think you'll really uh, learn a lot from listening to it. Okay, like I said before, it is Children's Grief Awareness Month. And Children's Grief Awareness Day within that month is coming up this Thursday, November 18th. It's always the third Thursday in November, or the week before Thanksgiving if you're in the U.S. And this week I am running a promo on my book, Future Widow. First time ever the ebook has been priced at just 99 cents. So that's actually 90% off of the regular price of $9.99. Uh, you can find it at Amazon and all the other ebook platforms, Apple, Google, Kobo, um, probably some of the other ones as well. If you can't find it, uh, just head over to Amazon because it's priced at 99 cents this week for sure there. Um, the promo seems to be going great so far. There have been lots and lots of purchases and the book is hitting number one in a whole bunch of categories on Amazon. So it's really exciting to see because my my reason for doing this and my goal um, for practically giving it away is to try to get the book into as many people's hands as possible. It It is a memoir, and it's about my family's journey with my husband's terminal cancer, but I've written it in such a way that I share our story and through that share um, a number of, of themes that I've worked in, including about parenting, grieving children, and also about being a good grief ally and supporting those around you who are going through uh, grief or loss or a medical crisis situation. So again, um, have a look on all the ebook platforms, including Amazon. Right now, if you're listening this week, um, this is, episode is dropping on November 17th, and it will be just 99 cents through this Saturday, the 20th of November. And if you're listening later, um, please check it, check it out anyway. Um, it won't be 99 cents, but I think you will enjoy it at the regular price as well. Okay, all for this week. As always, thank you for listening, and until next week, keep smiling! 
Thank you for listening to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Connect with us on social media and at widowedparentpodcast.com.